never happened since I've been on. <laughs> All right. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, and I think we uh, will call the meeting to order. And uh, Mr. Rux, do you want to do roll call? Yes. EC Bell? Wait. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Larry Hampton? Here. Melissa Daly? Here. Carol Sherwood? Here. Shannon Eoff? Here. All present. Wow. We did it. Okay, then. Um, minutes. Did everybody have a chance to at least glance at the minutes yeah. um, from last time? Yes, sir. We eventually, we're able to have them. I think we had to kind of stall a, a, a while to get a quorum last time, but then we did. So, uh, is there a motion to approve minutes? So moved. Okay. All second. second. Okay, thank you. Uh, any discussion or anything? All in favor of approving the minutes as presented, say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Any opposed? Hearing none. We are moving on. Uh, public comments. Doesn't look like anybody's here. Anyway. <laughs> um, so it looks like, Doug, you can launch into vertical housing development zone. All right, so we have with us today Keith Leonard, our associate planner, who's been managing the vertical housing development zone. So he's going to give your presentation. Thank you. And thank you for having me here at the, the meeting. So, um, yep, I'm here to, to present the vertical housing development zone. Uh, ne next slide, please. So, let me shrink this down so I can read that. My <clears throat> picture is right in front of some of the text. Not that I'm going to read the whole thing. Uh oh, now I lost everything. There we go. Okay. So, where does this all come from? Uh, the city put together the Newburgh Downtown Improvement Plan. This plan is really cool. If you haven't had a chance to read it, you should. Um, it has a whole lot of plans to make our downtown just a really cool place to, to live, work, and play. And then on page 54 and 55 of this plan, it talks uh, about a number of economic development tools to help this plan come to fruition. And one of those is the Vertical Housing Development Zone uh, program. So if you could uh, forward it to the next slide, please. So where does this, where, where does the Vertical Housing <coughs> Development Zone come from? It does come from a uh, state statute. It allows cities and counties to come to uh, agreements with the various taxing jurisdictions uh, to grant 10 year partial property tax exemptions for uh, new mixed use developments. Um, again, it's, it's limited to 10 years um, and it's also based on the number of floors, which I'll get into those details in, in the next couple of slides. And a vertical housing development zone can either be a single uh, parcel or it can be uh, multiple tax lots. So in this case, we're, we're choosing uh, the C3 and the M2 zone property within the Newburgh Downtown Improvement uh, Plan area. Uh, next next page, slide, please. So why support one of these programs? We want to have a healthy central business district. Um, these new mix uh, use developments are great for downtowns. Uh, increasing growth within the central business district it turns around and increases the county tax base as a whole. And in some cases, maybe we wouldn't have gotten one of these buildings built without this little extra incentive. Uh, we want to have people living and working in the downtown area, uh, less fossil fuels being, being spread around our, our atmosphere. People can just go out their, their front doors and, and walk to get some food or work. Uh, it also creates long-term community wealth. These mixed-use buildings tend to generate a lot of um, uh, tax base for the, the taxing jurisdictions. Uh, they're multi-story. And then uh, we also want to have walkable neighborhoods. We want to have folks walking around the downtown area, making it, it feel and look and be that vibrant area that every central business district strives to be. Next, next slide. So for the partial tax abatement, and this would be for market rate units, um, has to be a mixed use building, uh, multi-story. So the first floor is predominantly commercial. The second floor uh, has to be residential. 
and all those floors above would have to be residential uh, to, to gain the full benefit of this program. So it's partial tax exemption uh, last 10 years uh, with one floor residential above that first floor commercial, you get 20%, two, 40, three floors of residential, 60%, and four floors, uh, 80%. That is the max for the building and this is for market rate uh, housing. Next slide, please. There's also the ability to uh, 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 help out affordable housing projects. Uh, they do have to meet the 80% of the area median income, the, the, the residents. Uh, these uh, units would be monitored annually. You have to make sure that they remain affordable housing uh, and don't change somewhere along the line. Uh, the partial tax abatement, this would only be for the land. So the other, other one for the market rate is for the building. If they uh, provide affordable housing, then they would not only get the 20% off of the uh, uh, floors, but they would also get 20% off uh, for a one floor residential um, for the uh, a tax, partial tax abatement uh, temporary for 20% 20, uh, 20 for the first floor. Sorry about that. It goes, it goes all the way up to 80%, <laughs> just like the other one. Next slide, please. And this is the area that we're looking at. So to the north over by the railroad tracks, that's Sherman. Uh, then it kind of down the railroad tracks. Uh, it Dog legs kind of goes down to the frontage along 2nd Street. Uh, there is an area that it does move down by 3rd Street, um, over by the police department, I believe. Uh, no, that's not, that's not Howard. I, I apologize. That's between Edwards and, and the college. And then the uh, eastern boundary is River Street. It goes back up around uh, George Fox University covers the frontage along uh, East Hancock, and then we're back up to Sherman. That kind of completes the uh, vertical housing development zone that we're looking at. And all those properties within this area are either zoned uh, C3 or M2. Next slide, please. We also had Leland Consulting Group uh, look at uh, the parcels within the downtown improvement plan area. The blue line is actually the, the downtown improvement boundary. Um, so within that, there's a tiered system, tier one being the most developable and tier three being the least developable. There's about eight properties that are most easily to develop. And those are the ones in purple. Uh, about 4.71 acres and in total 13 potential sites. Next slide, please. So within the state statute, we are required to do a displacement analysis. Leland was hired to do this displacement analysis and their findings were that there was very low likelihood that this program would do anything to displace the, the current residents. Next slide, please. We also provided a uh, block uh, or a model and to do this, we looked at the union block model. This is indeed a uh, mixed use building. First floor is commercial, second is residential. It's located at 614 East First Street. It's, I'm sure that, that we all know where that one is. So ne next slide, please. Uh, some of the assumptions that we built into this, that this would be new construction. So that building that I just showed is not there. Um, we did utilize the 2019 real market value for the actual building, which is about $1.6 million. Uh, 2019 real market value for the land is about $278,000. We are projecting about a $2,000 increase uh, post-construction on that, that land value. And this model, these models are again for market rate residential units. Um, uh, it could be affordable and then that does kick up the, the temporary tax abatement slightly. Uh, we're projecting a 3%, oops, a 3% increase in value. And then Yamhill County Assessor does not differentiate between uh, the floors in these mixed use buildings. So if you have a first floor that's fully commercial and a second floor uh, that is fully residential, they take that value and, and basically split it. So we did the same thing. We split that value for the first and second floor for the base two-story model. Next slide, please. So here we are, we've had this building constructed and uh, uh, it's two stories. Second floor is, is, is uh, residential, building value is about $1.6 million. The tax collected with the abatement 
would still be about $32,000. The, the abated amount is, is $6,700. And then the estimated tax collected through years uh, 11 through 20, these are what we call the kicker years. Uh, the abatement has, has now sunset, so the taxing jurisdictions are getting the full benefit. And this model, I should also mention, is for the city of Newburgh. This is, would be specifically how it would impact our city. So um, after, after those the years 11 through 20, after the abatement's gone, about $53,000 coming into the city coffers. For a three-story model, uh, we've got two stories of residential on this one. Building would be worth about $2.5 million. The tax collected with abatement, abatement would be $36,000. Uh, the abated amount would be about $20,000. And then for years 11 through 20, <laughs> the taxes coming into the city would be about $76,000. Next slide, please. Oops, next slide, please. And uh, move my chair at the same time as, as I was speaking. So for a four-story building, this would be with three uh, residential floors. We're at 60% at this point. Uh, the value of that building uh, would be about $3.3 million. The estimated tax collected with abatement would still be $32,000. The abated amount would be about $40,000. And then for years 11 through 20, uh, the city would collect about $99,000 on this building. For the five story, here we are at the maximum uh, amount of that temporary abatement. Uh, the building would be worth about 4.2 million. Estimated tax collected with abatement is 22%. We again are at 80% abatement at this point. And then estimated tax collected, uh, tax cl abated uh, per years one through 10 would be about $67,000. And then for the kicker years, so years 11 through 20, the city would be collecting about $121,000. And this is on a uh, building that may not have been built without this little extra incentive. Next slide, please. We also looked at uh, the overall impact to all the taxing uh, jurisdictions. So the slide that you're looking at here is how much based on uh, the first floor, second floor, or one floor, two floors, three floors, and four floors of residential, this is what you'd be looking at. So for one floor, uh, the abated amount would be about $39,000 for those first 10 years. It's two, two stories of residential, 119, three, 238,000. And then for four stories, we're at the maximum 80%. Uh, the abated amount for years one through 10 would be about $397,000. Next slide, please. So we went and we presented to all the taxing districts and we have some really good news. They all opted in. Uh, so it would be a full program. The taxing uh, districts do have the option to opt out, but they felt that this was beneficial enough to the uh, overall uh, tax base that, that they thought it would be something that, that they wanted to opt in and be part of. Next slide, please. So the Planning Commission recommended approval on April 8th uh, for this. We're, we are here to, uh, uh, oh, and we're here at the Affordable Housing Committee. I was gonna add that, I didn't add it to the slide, but May 17th, we will be at the City Council uh, meeting. This would be the, the first reading. And we would like to also take your uh, recommendation to the City Council. It will be built into the, the report delivered to the City Council. And then if we do need a second reading, sometimes they waive the second reading, uh, that would be on June 7th. So <laughs> that, that's the conclusion of my presentation and I'd be happy to answer uh, questions for you if I could. Anybody have questions? I had a comment, is that okay? Um, so I just uh, was gonna say, I think this is an incredibly good idea. Um, I think that developers um, would, um, it would be an opportunity and it, it would encourage the four and five story buildings because the, the amount of, you know, rent revenue that they're going to have um, compared to that, the taxes that we're seeing there. Um, I think they would be incredibly motivated budget wise to do this, so. We hope so. <laughs> have we have we had a limit on the height of buildings in that area 
in the past. The height of buildings within that area is limited by the, the airport. So generally, it's about 150 feet. Um, Doug is more familiar with that, but that's that seems to be what, what we tell folks all the time. Okay. So, I think the other part of that, Larry, is that when we did the uh, downtown improvement plan, the community feedback was no taller than four or five story buildings. So this model reflects that. Has the model been run by any developers so far? It just, I know it hasn't been approved, but I wonder if they have had any feedback as to whether or not what they think. Uh, I can tell you that uh, we haven't ran it by, by developers, but this program is active, and I, I hate to mention it, in the Portland metro area. Uh, a lot of the cities up there have this program. It's worked. It's worked in Tigard. It's worked in Beaverton. So there are um, developers that have utilized this. Um, and in all honesty, they've utilized it for the market rate housing. Um, I haven't talked to them. I haven't heard of any affordable housing uh, being uh, produced by this. I wish it would be, but that's what I've, I've been told. So uh, I, a couple of years ago, um, there was a develop, developer uh, family investment group that I was actually talking with. And we talked with Doug about a project that they were interested in. And uh, we kept looking for lots um, downtown and uh, we're looking at potentially buying a building um, that didn't work out. But um, the the key there was being able to go up in the number of stories to make the project cost effective because with just the two existing stories in the building, um, the, the rate of like SDCs and taxes and all those things, um, it just, it wasn't really coming together budget wise completely. And so um, seeing the numbers here, um, that same group would have jumped all over this. So, yeah. Well, that's exciting. Would would that apply? I mean, could you take a building that's already there and add stories to it and have it count in this program? Yes, uh, the program does work for rehabilitation of existing buildings yeah. as well. So yeah, you could have somebody that would extend it. Say you have a, a two-story building now where there isn't um, um, residential use on, on the second floor. It could also work that way. They could they could uh, redevelop it for for uh, units up there. Can, do current buildings that are already in existence with a residential do they qualify? No. No, this would have to be on improvements, either a new building or improvements to the building where where we're getting some more residential units up on that second floor. And I think uh, some of the community feedback might center around parking again. Parking is the, the ever present issue that keeps coming up, but um, I'm sure that they'd be required in the planning process to plan accordingly. So Yeah, for residential units, I believe in downtown, correct me if I'm wrong, Doug, it's one per dwelling unit. So uh, if we were out, outside of the downtown uh, in uh, uh, high density residential, then we'd be looking at the number of bedrooms to figure out uh, the way parking would be. But for the downtown, that's what they've done. There, there's also the ability to look at, uh, say there isn't enough uh, to park uh, all the residential units uh, right on the property. We can look, I believe it's 400 feet within that area and there could be something done where, where um, there could be an agreement to provide par additional parking there. And we also have the fee and lube program as well. And we get to count the uh, on street parking spaces on the frontage of a development as part of the parking for that. So we've added to our toolbox for parking in the downtown area. And just just to be clear, see if I was clear on it, the, the difference between the market rate or affordable housing was that the abatement applies to the first floor as well on on affordable housing, is that correct? No, so that first floor would still be fully taxed. It, it would it goes to the, the second floor being residential, third, fourth, right. and fifth being residential, and then you get the same 20, 40, 60, and 80 percent uh, breaks, but it would be for the, the land. Oh, for the land as well, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. so that, that's where the affordable housing part of it comes in. Okay. Um, and then for the market rate, it's on the building. Right. Uh, okay. If it's affordable, okay. then they get uh, on the building and on the land. 
Right. Okay. Thank you. That that's what I was I was trying to figure out what the difference was and how there was a benefit for affordable. Thank thanks. That makes sense. And how long does the project have to be affordable again for this to apply? There would have to be at least 10 years of the the residential floors have there's a process to look at them annually to make sure that they're still hitting those marks um making sure that the um uh, first floor is still uh meeting the requirements for commercial um so they they have to meet the, these requirements for 10 years if they don't at that point the the abatement can be pulled away from them the other side of that ledger shannon is if a developer utilized this program and also utilize the construction excise tax, that would mean that those units would have to be affordable for 60 years. Okay, okay. So think of it as walking up the stairs. We have different programs that add on. Yeah, I think this one's gonna be, you know, I, I think it's more practical. It's highly practical, you know. And Carol, uh, going back to your question about developers, as we've been in the development of this for a couple of years now, and I have talked with potential developers downtown uh, about the fact that we were trying to develop this program and get it in front of city council, and the responses were positive towards it. We just did not have it in place. So my, what I think I heard from you was you would like to know if we are in general and supportive. It didn't sound like it's necessarily that we're voting to, I, Doug, do you, is that true? We but are you, looking for a recommendation okay. um, from you. Okay. Keith, didn't you write that motion in here somewhere? Uh, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, the recommendation was that the Affordable Housing Commission recommend approval of the vertical housing development zone to the city council. Okay. And that would require a vote. Okay. All right. Um, I'd make a motion to, to say that. Okay. <laughs> I don't do I have to say that exact thing. You can say so moved. <laughs> okay. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right. Any other discussion about that? Don't want to cut anybody off. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. It is approved. So um, yes, we are in support of that. Are you staying with us, Keith, or are you done? Uh, I, I have some land use reports to work on. So sure you do. I hope that you have an excellent meeting and thank you so much for your support. And, and we do hope that this, this creates even a better downtown than what we already have. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Doug, moving on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm yeah. not gonna do a PowerPoint because I'm PowerPointed out over the there course of the last year. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just gonna get to hear my voice if that's okay. Um, so this one is a uh, proposal for um, the uh, get my head, the duplex component um, of the uh, middle housing program. So I gave you some briefings on this previously. We're now to the point where we have draft code language worked up with our consultants, 3J Consulting and Jet Planning. Um, uh, Melissa was chairing the ad hoc committee for all of this. So she's heard all of this many, many, many times, but now you see it in it's kind of its final form in shape from all the preliminary material. So in your packet, um, this was one, the legislature passed the bill in uh, 2019 for the middle housing, the administrative rules finally got put together in late, mid to late 2020. Uh, we re, uh, the council convened an ad hoc committee. Uh, they started meeting in October and they concluded their work in March of 2021. We did a variety of outreach efforts. So we had a couple of community open houses. I know some members participated in those. We did a couple of surveys. And so all of that survey information, which I thought might be valuable to you, I included in the packet, same material that will go to the planning commission and the city council. Um, so the, what occurs with the duplex provision in essence is that 
everywhere where we allow a detached single family home. So think of our R1, R2, R3, AR, and, and RP districts, acronym city, um, is that you would now also be allowed to have a duplex. Right, right. So the lot sizes would be the same for each of those zones for both a single family detached and for a duplex unit. Um, as noted in your packet, there were 52 different sections of the development code that we had to go through and amend. Um, we also, and in that, uh, we dealt with lot sizes. We were increasing uh, lot coverage slightly. Duplexes, we can require no more than one off street parking space per duplex. That would only be two off street spaces for those two units. Uh, there was a lot of conversation early on with the ad hoc committee about parking. Uh, there was a lot of feedback from the community about parking. Uh, but this is what the law says. The law encouraged to have none, um, but the committee recommended one for each, each unit. Um, so I mentioned those lot side issues. Uh, setbacks stayed the same. We're keeping uh, duplex height the same in the R1, but we are increasing it in the R2 and the R3. Um, particular zones, we had to address the stream corridor uh, because we do have stream corridors. You could do some small expansions into a stream corridor if you have an existing house. So this is like a conversion situation. Uh, we had to have language about conversion of a single family home into a duplex. Um, so we had to add language for that. We needed to look at driveway spacing widths. Um, currently in single family, we have 40 foot requirement between driveways, but for duplexes, that's going to get closer because it depends on how the duplex might get built. You could have the driveways on the outside, you could have them in the middle. Uh, so you know, we proposing some changes there to 22 feet between driveways. So if it's a combined driveway, that's fine. If you have two driveways separated, they were on the outside of that lot, there'd have to be 22 feet. That in part was to address the issue about on-street parking to make sure we had some on-street parking that was available. Um, we also had to look at specific plans. So we had to look at the Northwest Newburgh specific plan, the Springbrook Oaks, the Springbrook master plan. We had to look at the airport master plan. Um, and we concluded that we did, make, did not need to make any changes to the airport master plan but we did in some of the others. So in your packet, there's an exhibit that has one change to our comp plan. Then we have the 52 section changes to the development code. Then there's some proposed language changes that will be notes in the Northwest <laughs> specific plan. Same thing in the Springbrook Oaks. There's a couple of sections in there that we needed to add some notes. In the Springbrook master plan, we had to amend the use table to add in duplexes. Fortunately for the riverfront plan, we didn't have to make anything changes to that, just the development code compo uh, component sufficed to meet those requirements. Um, a lot of work. We've gone through all of the findings that we have to do for the, our comprehensive plan. And for the statewide planning goals, I'm sure I will further embellish those before we get to a final version before the city council. Uh, and then we had to address all of the administrative rule provisions that relate to duplexes as part of the new middle housing code. So we've done that. We've gone out for referral to agencies and gotten comments. I know that there are some other organizations that are reviewing our material, so they may have additional comments before we get to the planning commission and to the city council. I know there is a lot here. Like I said, I did want to do a PowerPoint. We have PowerPoints. Melissa has seen all the PowerPoints uh, <laughs> over and over again. But um, the city council wanted to make sure that we had this go in front of the affordable housing commission so that they can look at it, provide any feedback, and so ultimately what we'd like you to do is to make a motion recommending the city council adopt the comprehensive plan amendments, the development code amendments, and the amendments to the Northwest, Springbrook Oaks, and the Springbrook Master Plan. So I will stop there. And I know you all read it.
<laughs> we've talked about this in our group for a while too i'm skimming it again right now so but i have not read it thoroughly now well and really when it comes down to it isn't this aren't we required by law to do this anyway yes we are required by law to do this so i was just i was a lot to glean through you know page after page in the code yeah. and figure out where we needed to make changes we cleaned up we had some different nomenclature uh, in different sections of the code. And we cleaned all of that up. So everything now consistent. So there's the new de definitions. And our definitions align with uh, what's in the administrative rule. Uh, and then that sets the stage and the rest of the code of where we needed to make all of these changes. And so, yeah, administrative rule is prescriptive. Um, we had two paths that we could have gone down with this. We could have taken the approach that we did, or we could have just adopted a model code and the ad hoc committee, we talked about this very early on. And we went down this path of specifically looking at our code as the administrative rule requires rather than following the model code. So it's tailored more for Newberg. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, are we ready to make a motion here? Somebody wanna uh, move? I, I'll move. Okay. I haven't There's done that. anything seriously egregiously wrong, so. <laughs> I'll second. Okay, thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We're rolling, Doug. Keep us going. Okay, I'm just finishing my note. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Needs analysis. Uh, housing needs analysis, housing strategy, and the public, semi-public. So the council has accepted the housing needs analysis. They accepted the public, semi-public land analysis, and they have accepted uh, the housing strategy. So all of those documents have now been accepted by council. Uh, for those where we had grant funds, which was on the housing and the housing strategy, uh, we've submitted all of our required paperwork to uh, Department of Land Conservation and Development. Um, so the next step in that process is on May 17th, I will be giving a presentation to council about here's your options. And in that we're also adding in the economic opportunities analysis. And so council, what would you like us to do? I'll kind of use the bookend analogy. One could be you upzone properties within the city to meet our land deficiency for housing. The other end is you just do a UGB expansion. In the middle is you do a combination of activities, both for the housing side and the employment side. So we'll start those conversations on the 17th. I'm assuming it will take several meetings to work through all of the various iterations and nuances before we get some direction from the city council what they would like staff to do. Um, so a big bunch of work over the course of the last year and a half has been completed. On the infrastructure-based time extension, so this relates back to the middle housing. So uh, we got a grant from DLCB for that. We uh, did that analysis work. Uh, council accepted the memos. We submitted our report into DLCB. Um, they concurred with our analysis. So, so we had one deficiency in infrastructure in the areas immediately north of downtown and south of downtown and that was water and it was related to fire flow so we had one location up north of downtown that needs a water line replacement and then we had water line replacements in the south area of downtown so those projects totaled about six and a half million dollars we anticipated it would take us about eight years to upgrade all of those water lines uh, DLCD agreed with us. And so we've got that determination in hand now. And so uh, our city engineer is working that into the capital improvement program for the next five years. And so we should have the first water line work done for the North area in about a year or so next fiscal year. And then we'll start to move into the area in the South. It, that does not mean it precludes the ability to do middle housing. It just strategically we're going to have to pay attention about where there's infill lots and so forth or where they can go where there is adequate water infrastructure uh, and other locations it may be that they have to wait or that they have to pay 
uh, to do some uh, upsizing of lines, but we know water lines can get expensive relatively quickly. So that was good news to come back from the state. Any questions on that one? Riverfront master plan implementation. So the council has accepted, uh, well, they adopted a comprehensive plan amendment to our transportation system plan for the riverfront area. Um, so that project is now done, it's went into effect. On Monday evening, they will be reviewing and he having their hearings on the water and the wastewater infrastructure. Uh, if they approve those, then they would take effect 30 days later. And those again amend our comprehensive plan and then the water and the wastewater master plans. Uh, the fourth leg of that is our stormwater. And our stormwater master plan is in process. We're doing a briefing to the uh, city council on May 17th. And then we'll come back to council with their public hearing on that comp plan and master plan amendment on June 21st. So we're close to getting uh, the implementation pieces from the functional plans done. There was one additional item I found in an annexation, annexation section of our code uh, related to the mixed employment on the mill site. At the time it's annexed and applying that zone. So I'm working on that one and that will get in front of city council on June 21st as well. So by the end of June, we should have all of the structural pieces in place for the implementation of the Riverfront master plan area. Um, the next one then gets to the urban renewal plan and report. So we are working on that. Council accepted the feasibility study back in July. In August, we created an urban renewal agency. Uh, we've been working with an ad hoc committee, working through uh, the projects that, that could be in that plan. So we started with a list of projects that totaled $117 million. And we had to winnow that list down to around 55 million. So it took a number of months to get through that process. Um, basically the priority was the industrial area first, then areas where we have mixed employment, then areas where we can go vertical mixed use, both in the riverfront and the downtown area. And then the last portion, and then next would be high density residential development. And then the last or at the bottom of that list was areas for uh, detached single family development. So we put together uh, a project list uh, that in 2020 dollar values needed to be no more than $61.9 million. That would have equated to a $114 million maximum indebtedness amount, in which there was a little over 9 million of that is for administration costs over a 30 year period. Um, the mill site owners appealed their tax bill. Uh, that went before the county. The county uh, approved that appeal. So that reduced their real market value of the mill site from over 20 million down to four and a half million. Mm. And so we got information a couple of weeks ago, the new uh, assessor information. And so we had to go back and retool our project list. And we had that meeting last night and we had to remove $5.8 million worth of projects. Uh, and essentially, so I worked with the mill owner and we dropped two uh, north-south industrial roadways out of it. And then we reduced the funding for a portion of Blaine Street, um, which is primarily, it was underground. So that's an area where there could be high density residential housing. So we were looking at keeping some of the infrastructure, underground infrastructure, but not funding issues on sidewalks. And so the stuff behind the curb line on Blaine Street. So that uh, committee agreed with that approach last night. So our consultants are moving forward with preparing the plan and the report. Uh, some consultants working on all the financial modeling and making necessary revisions. We will be bringing the urban renewal plan back to that committee for their final meeting on May 24th and their recommendation. Uh, from there, it then goes to the urban renewal agency for their review and consideration and referral. 
And after that, then we go to the taxing districts and go through what's called a confer consult process. We will also with the county have to go through a process for them to approve the urban renewal plan because some of the land area is outside the city limits, but within the urban growth boundary. And then all of that information comes back to the city council on August 2nd for their public hearing on the plan and the report. So a lot of work ahead here over the next four months or so, uh, but things are moving forward. I should also say that the agency held its first official meeting. Thanks to Sue, she got me all lined up on that. And uh, so they held their first meeting, they elected their chair and vice chair, and they adopted their initial bylaws. And in those bylaws, uh, it will be uh, forming a, uh, uh, an urban renewal advisory committee that will be advisory to the city council. So that would not get constituted until after a plan is approved and officially adopted. So a lot of stuff on the urban renewal front. We're also out uh, doing presentations to different groups and organizations virtually uh, around town about urban renewal. Uh, if you want to know more, you can check out uh, the planning webpage and there's videos and lots of information on that program. Um, Part of it and how it plays into the affordable housing is that there's infrastructure, it's all infrastructure, transportation, sewer, water, uh, storm drainage, is that areas that are within that that we've identified infrastructure, it can help jumpstart getting some uh, multifamily development to occur or just getting housing to occur. And we all know, everybody in the state of Oregon, I think across the country right now, you know, housing shortage, there's a housing shortage in every state. Questions on that one? Okay. Uh, the NOFA. So the NOFA went out uh, 1st of March and it's up on the website. Uh, I have not received any applications yet. Um, so that closes on May 31st. So we're just a little over 30 days away. Uh, we'll see what happens uh, for those who've been on the commission for a while. We've done this and we've never gotten an application. So maybe this is the year. <laughs> Keep our fingers crossed, absolutely. The community development block grant. So I've been coordinating with the uh, housing authority on that. Uh, we've had submitted our pre-application material to Business Oregon. Uh, they've reviewed it, given us combat, uh, comments back. Uh, Darcy Reynolds is making those changes. Um, I have to electronically sign the application by the end of the day, Friday. So we're in position, we had more emails today. So we're doing one last look at the application and then I'll get it signed and then we'll be in the queue. We're not anticipating hearing if we were successful in our application until the end of July. Uh, so we may not know before we get to our next meeting, which is on July 27th. So that is moving forward. One thing I did not put on this list uh, because it was late breaking news. And so we had budgeted for a housing planner, uh, somebody to work on the roughly 50 housing action items that have been identified. And uh, we had applications that got reviewed. We had uh, interview scheduled and then people dropped out of the interview. So I have to re-engage and start the recruitment process all over again. <laughs> So we'll be getting to that this week and, and get again out there for 30 days. So if you happen to know anybody who's got some housing experience and some land use experience, um, we will be recruiting again for that open position because there's a, a lot of work items um, to get done over the course of the next five years because all of you did the heavy lifting on trying to develop that program and the council only made a few shifts and some horizons on a few projects. And that, Mr. Chair, is all I have. Oh, wait, 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 what? <laughs> I, I have an item when you're ready, <laughs> Chair. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, so I'm trying to do the mail up for the committees that I just emailed you about and I'm going to mail you about and whatever, just trying to double task. So, hey, it's spring and that means it's committee recruitment time. 
So some of you may not realize that the council has changed committee membership. Um, they passed a resolution in March, uh, 2021, 37, 27, that adds a youth commissioner to each eligible city committee. And I won't get into why they're on some and not on others. If you wanna know, I'll, I'll give you more details than you ever wanted. Um, but yours is one of those committees. And so I am asking you to help me um, spread the word. We are looking in brief for um, youth commissioners for affordable housing, citizens rate review, historic preservation, library and planning commission. Now youth is not just high school. In 2017, um, former mayor Bob Andrews uh, changed the membership requirement for students to be both high school and college. So if you know of anyone who attends college, um, even if they live in Newburgh and go you know, remote somewhere else or commute somewhere else, they are eligible. Um, and then for adult members, we do have vacancies on historic preservation and two on citizens rate review. So I emailed committee members last night um, there's some handy little links in that email to a, um, we now have an online form um, so that people can fill that little web form out. Um, or if they want a paper one, um, they can, that's still up on the website or I can mail them one. Um, and I just wanted to say a uh, thank you to, we have two departing high school seniors, Colin Bullock for the planning commission and Asher Tatsumi for historic preservation who are both graduating this year. And so we wish them the best. So um, if you have a lead or you have someone you could think of, um, if you could forward that information on to them, um, maybe you coach the team and you've got a student that would be interested, we're accepting applications until June 1st. And then we are changing the selection process. Um, the council has a subcommittee making a number of changes to the committee system um, here. And one of those is that they will be selected by interview um, rather than just direct appointment by the mayor. So um, let me know if you have any follow-up questions and help me out, spread the word. Thank you. Just one other thing I might have for the commission members is I brought up before with the uh, implementation of the construction excise tax. And so we have started collecting those revenues uh, effective January 2nd of 2021. Um, we're not looking at expending any of those funds this fiscal year, but potentially in the next fiscal year. And so that's gonna require me to go back and look at how this commission was established because it was done by resolution and you have your operating principles, administrative procedures in place. But in the past, we've talked about actually restructuring that so it's an official commission that's listed in the municipal code, like the planning commission or the traffic safety commission and so forth. Um, we also may consider adding a couple more members. So we started off with this commission being three, and then we increased it to five. Then we have an, uh, some uh, ex officio seat that's there. So we'll want to talk about should, you know, this commission be seven or not, or do we keep it at five? Um, but your roles and responsibilities will change because you will have a, a new activity to review any uh, partnerships between the city and developers for affordable housing outside of the trust fund purview. Uh, which then could also potentially mean we need to meet more frequently. And again, I don't have answers, but I've got a kind of a running list in my head of things that we need to talk about. So I thought I would add those to the agenda in July and start those discussions, if that was okay. Yep. Sounds good. Okay. And, and Doug, is it true that, you know, we've, I mean, the, the duplexes is moving on and, and the next thing is the triplexes and that sort of thing coming up as, as well. Yes, and so uh, the ad hoc committee looked at all of the regulations that we need to change for triplexes, quadplexes, cottage clusters and townhomes. Uh, the consultants will have that uh, prepared. Uh, well, how is it? They will have that prepared here shortly in the format you saw tonight 
or today with all the code sections we need to change. We will be doing a work session with the Planning Commission and City Council on June 7th for that component, because uh, I've got to close out that grant by June 15th. And then we'll be back in front of the um, Planning Commission, City Council, and the Affordable Housing Commission in the October through December timeframe. Uh, to get recommendations on all of that with the intent to have a, a final hearing with the council by the end of December. Okay. All right. Any other, any questions or comments or anything from anybody? Any, anything at all? Seeing none, I would, uh, Let's see, do I move to it? Do we move to adjourn? Do we just say you should get a motion to adjourn motion in a second. <laughs> yes. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yes. So moved. All right. And a second? I'll second. Other, otherwise, you got to stay here all afternoon, you know. So, <laughs> all right. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. It's Thank great to have a full slate of people showing up. Thank you. Yeah. You create a welcoming environment, Larry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So much more than you did, EC. I don't know why. <laughs> we didn't do this earlier. Uh, <laughs> I just want to say that you, you moved that to material you much you moved that material much faster than the 200 pages implied you would be able to. <laughs> <laughs> I got to about page 50 and the thought, this is not going to, I'm not getting done, so. <laughs> I try to hit the highlights for you. <laughs> there you go. Most of it we've heard something about before, so. All right. And I Thank try you. to make sure that I touch you a number of times before we ever get a final product so I don't hit you blind with the right. material. Yep. Okay. Right. Thank, Thank you. you all. See ya. Bye. Bye.